situation where you actually climb inside a virtually described system. That's where you have goggles on and probably even have something called data gloves. And what you see is what's displayed on two screens in front of you and you actually feel like you're inside an electronic world. And again, they had that at the Myers Center, I think, recently during, during the break. Multimedia changes your sensory perceptions in terms of how you work with electronics. At the moment, we read something and we work with what's on the screen. Now you can get into the full panoply of full visual environments where when you turn your head, you're actually looking at different parts of the environment. Um, there's no reason why I can't work with feeling through your hands, why I can't work with smell and so forth. It's, um, again, an interesting application. It's an indication that this technology gets well ahead of how we might want to use it. The technology is invented. It's then left up to our imagination in terms of how we're going to apply it. And virtual reality is one of those technologies. You hear a lot about it for the next 18 months because it'll be all the go in the press and then it'll die. You might hear about it on, out in Hindley Street, you know, the kids sitting down, shooting down airplanes and fighting each other with these, you know, systems where they feel like they're actually working together with, uh, you know, in, in battle situations and so forth. But you'll wake up in about 15 years' time and realize, in trying to apply the imagination, I've only ever seen one film that has given me an example of how you might use it in, in a business environment. Let's say that you're working in a financial area in a bank or with a stockbroker, and one of your jobs is to buy stocks. Your main interest is in, let's say, steel. Okay, so steel's your business. If it's steel, they come to you. You know what's going on in the steel market. You know what stocks are doing, how they're performing, the international markets, and so forth. Now, you make a decision about what steel stocks you're going to buy based on the profile of the customer in terms of what sorts of purchases you want to make. They might want a very high risk, but therefore high return, you know, product. They might want low risk, low return, or whatever. But the environments that are going to affect the sorts of decisions you make on the steel side are, you know, how healthy is the steel market in comparison to other markets? Um, how healthy is specifically the market we're thinking of going into? How healthy is the economy generally? Because wherever goes the economy, so goes such a large industry like steel. Specifically, the company I'm looking at, what has its performance been over the last three or four years? What are the projections for this company? Has it got the management to carry it through the next five or ten years? Is it using up-to-date technology or is it old technology? All sorts of things will help you to posit where steel stocks are going to be going and therefore which ones you're going to buy. Now, in a virtual reality system, there's no reason why you can't design a system that electronically will set, let's say, a field of wheat. And each stalk of wheat is a stock. Now, the ground itself, the soil, could be, its mixture could be determined based on what the economy is like. The rain that might fall over a period which is going to make the stocks to grow could be based on specifically the, um, the economy of the market that you're looking at. I'm looking at Southeast Asia, I'm looking at Europe, I'm looking at America, which is a dying market or whatever. America, obviously not as much rain would fall. Southeast Asia, possibly a lot of rain would fall. The color of the stock, green to yellow, obviously yellow is unhealthy, green is very healthy, could be based on the past performance of the stock. The size of the wheat head could be based on your projections or the projections that are being made about the health of this specific company you're looking at. So you're actually in a virtual world where you can see fields of corn or wheat or whatever growing. And if you want to buy high performing stocks, you go for the tall ones that are very green with large heads on them. And as you pull them with your data glove like this, it will actually buy the stocks for you. So when you go to work, you actually walk into a world where you're interacting in all senses with the stocks rather than just reading dead figures. You may want to buy some of the yellow colored stocks that are rather shriveled because maybe you're buying for somebody who wants to buy up old companies to rejuvenate them or to asset strip them or whatever. So you've got a variety of reasons in terms of what you might want to buy. So there's one rather esoteric one, but let's just bring it back to earth a little bit. And let's say you're an order processing person and one of the things you do is you take calls on the telephone from people who want to buy, you know, from customers who want to buy goods from you. One of your concerns is, I mean, what's their paying situation like? I mean, uh, what's, what's their credit situation? And as you type things in, typically, you type in the customer number, and up it'll come, you might get a red flash on the screen saying, you know, danger, uh, poor paying customer, or something like that, or $3 million outstanding, credit only $2.5 million, whatever. Well, wouldn't it be better if you pick up the telephone or whatever? The telephone will have the intelligence to know who's dialing. I mean, those systems are already around. They can say, hey, this is number 230-6057. You've got a program in your computer. That's Fred Nerd Enterprises. And all of a sudden, this rotten smell comes over the phone, Ugh, right? And what it is, is the computer's programmed a rotten smell to come in and saying, hey, don't touch this customer, right? I mean, there's your senses coming to the fore to say, oh, God, I don't want to deal with this person. I'm sorry, we won't take your order, right? Okay, so there are various ways you can do it. But the interesting thing is that we tend to believe anything that comes off a computer at the moment, and it's only as good as what's being put in and who's programmed it. 
when we get into an environment where all our senses are at work, okay, our eyes, sight, smell, and everything, it's going to be awfully hard to deny what we've got in front of us as not being correct. But we still have to understand that the virtual world that we're in is being created by somebody. Okay, that's over the top number one today. We'll be going over the top a couple of times. But um, let's talk now then about hardware systems, shall we, and look at storage. It's all in your books, right? So I just want to hit the high points today and uh, take a bit of a light-hearted look at some of this stuff and maybe give you some opinions about what I think about the, the technologies we're going to be seeing and so forth. And you take them for, for whatever it's worth. Storage devices are used basically either to store data or to store programs. If we're storing data, we're storing data either for reference, like, you know, a pay rate is something that stays there all the time. Every week we pay somebody, we have to refer to what their pay rate is. So it's there for a period, for reference. We may be storing something for a short period, like how many hours did they work this week? And I keep that around until we actually have the payroll, calculate with pay rate times how many hours they worked, and then I don't need to keep that information anymore. Or we may want to keep something for a long period that we're not even going to look at, like tax history, but maybe somewhere along the line for legal implications, we have to keep it for a period. Storage these days on computer systems is very heavily based around disks. Tape technology used to have uh, a, a position for storing, but doesn't these days, and we'll get around to talking about what, what minor function it performs now in computing. When we talk about disks, we have hard disks and floppy disks. And again, floppy disks for a very good reason, as most of you know, because the original floppy disks were really quite floppy. Two sizes, five and a quarter and three and a half. I don't know what that is in decimals, and I don't really care. But they didn't start that way, by the way. It started with eight and a half, right? Now, you talk about this thing awkward to put in your top pocket, but you can imagine one of these in your top pocket doesn't quite work. So when these came out, it was a revolution. But now you know my opinion about these things. Really, they should be chucked out because they do fit well into your top pocket. They don't bend, fold, mutilate. You don't have to have a little slip on it because it's got its own little cover that automatically closes and so forth. Inside here, by the way, that's what you're paying for. It's probably about five cents worth of plastic. OK, that's what you're storing your data on. Now. My opinion is these things should be scrapped, they should be thrown away, but then again in the environment where we are now we shouldn't really throw anything away, we should um, recirculate it, right? We should, uh, what do you call it, um, recycle. We've got all of these five and a quarter inch discs, I don't know what we're going to do with them, but here's some ideas. Just this is five out of 101 ideas of what to do with a dead five and a quarter inch disc. You can cut them up like little doilies <laughs> for teapots, right? Remember grandma used to do that? Inside these things, They've got this nice little fluffy stuff which keeps the disc clean. Now, I see my wife, you can rip that out, and I see my wife doing a lot of this stuff at night. So she's got a couple of those for free. The disc thing that it comes in, uh, if it's nice and white on the back, you can fold it over and use it as an envelope, as long as you don't want to put your return address on the back, that's fine. And do you realize the toothpick industry in this company is run by the Indonesians? Firstly, any toothpick you get, box of toothpicks, they're from Indonesia. They're the guys with the wood. They chop it up and send us toothpicks. Now, with a plastic cover that comes on these things, you can chop them up into nice little things like that, and they're great on your teeth. They really are clean. So, recycling, there's all sorts of opportunities for your five and a quarter inch discs. So don't throw them out, but for God's sakes, get rid of them, right? They're useless. Okay, they come in two, two densities, both of them three and a half and five and a quarter. Density meaning that you can store twice as much on the high density versus the low density. So, for instance, on the little three and a halves, the three and a half will have two holes. Instead of just one hole, it will have two, and that indicates high density. Inside still, actually, is a floppy disk. So as you open it up, whoops, a little bit falling out. There's a floppy disk. Now, on a disk that size now, we're storing what we're storing on the five and a quarter, which we used to store on the eight and a half inch disk. It's still the same thing inside. It just happens to be manufactured to a slightly higher quality standard. So they charge you twice as much to be able to store twice the data. And people say to me, oh my god, Mac, I just bought a disk and it's only a low density. I can only store 720,000 characters. I wish I'd bought a high density because I'd store 1.4 million characters. And I say, when the hell are you ever going to type 1.4 million characters, right? You can get a low density disk, and I guarantee that the disk will clap out before you manage to fill it up, right? The dog's going to chew it. It's going to get run over in the railway. You're going to lose it somewhere, or it's just going to get worn out, or someone's going to rip the little steel piece off or something before you fill it up. The low density is perfectly good enough. What's the rush to get the high density? Now, you talk about 720,000 characters. What does it add up to? Remember history in high school? I found it deadly boring. The only thing that was interesting was that the 24-year-old history teacher was making it off with the arts teacher. And when I was 14, that was very exciting. But other than that, history was dead boring. 
until I got my first job and realized what boredom really was. And they gave me a manual and said, look, kid, read this for three weeks and we'll talk to you once you know something about our account system, right? And I thought, oh, God, this is dreadful. So at lunchtime, I went down, went to a bookshop, and I got the history of the world in 240 pages. I mean, there it is, Genghis Khan, one paragraph, how he hyped out, you know, wiped out half the Western civilized world or whatever. But there it is, 240 pages, history of the world, will fit on one of these $1 disks, okay? So that's the sort of capacity you're talking about on just a low-density disk. By the way, the little hole we have here, why does that exist? You know, when you put your label on, it says write enable and write protect. Well, fine, if it's up, that means that the computer can actually write on the disk. When it's down, it can't. That ring a bell? Remember these chappies here? Right? You know, when you go out and buy a commercial thing, it's got the little back thing knocked out, hasn't it? You ever got your old uh, records from Barnsley? You say, oh, shit, I can't stand it anymore. I I'm going to use this tape and tape to my grandma. And you find out you can't tape on because that's been knocked out. So the reason you wouldn't want to be talking about businesses where you do have large databases, you can be talking about five, seven million characters in a database. You can't use floppies. And anyway, you, you want speed. So you go towards a hard disk. Now, hard disks typically come in stacks. And especially in larger computers, they come in very large stacks. So it's a disk like this, or even smaller, right? Except it's hard. And it's fixed inside the computer and might be stacked. One of the rims on this disk would be designated as a table of contents. And the computer would say, I want Harry's record. Table of contents would say, you'd find Harry's record on top surface of disk 4, track 33. So this read-write little head would spin in and pick it up as it came by. And this disk can be spinning it up to 80 kph as it goes past these read-write heads. And these things go in and out so quickly you don't even see them. They're a blur. The engineering behind is absolutely astounding. And it can pick up Harry's record in a 10,000th of a second and send it back to the CPU. Incredible. On the disk are not actually physically inscribed, but logically exist these circles. And indeed, when you format a disk, you buy a disk and format it, what the computer is doing is setting up these logical tracks on your disk, identifying track zero as a table of contents, and setting up the table of contents ready to set, take data and so forth. And then when data gets recorded, you can think of it again logically as looking like this, that it's got segments to each section of the disk. And there's Harry's record. Go to the top side of disk 4, track 33 on track 33. Wait till address 14,853 comes by. As it zooms by at 80 kph, pick it up right, and read it in. Now, those are large computer systems. Sorry, I should show you this. The technology is such that the head that actually reads the surface of the disk is this far off. There's a cigarette smoke particle, a fingerprint ridge, and indeed the size of a human hair. So obviously these things have to be completely sealed. You get any dirt in them, and you're done. And in the old days, that meant that these things had to be isolated in dust-free rooms and had to be on special mats, and you couldn't have vibrations and so forth. But now they make them such that you can almost drop a computer, and they still work. How they do it, I don't know. But they now look like this. Here's one out of a faculty machine that collapsed. Now, mind you, even that is fairly large now. They're about half this size. But a disk that size, you should be able to now hold something like 120 million characters on it. Okay? And I think they've now got them down to half size, three and a half inches, and that's about five inches or something. But this came actually from one of our techos. It's the only uh, woman I've ever seen walking around with a screwdriver who's quite happy to pull anything apart. She's incredible, works very well, does all our DOS machines here. But she's got some incredibly technical language that sometimes is very hard to understand. I asked her, hey, look, if you do manage to get one of these things, and I have it because I want to show it to a class. So she gave me this thing, and here's her technical language about what happened here. Went bang, still smells, doesn't work, which I thought was very technical. And indeed, you can see the went bang and still smells because it's actually blown the back off one of these microchips, the plastic cover, and you actually see the microchip inside. So I'll send this around. But again, you can see the read-write heads and the disk. And you, know, you can actually even, no, you can't on this one. You can't spin the disk. But Whatever. This, by the way, is technology that's 12 years old. There's a disk crash. Actually, the, the head hit the disk going at 80 kph and, of course, just ground a hole in it. And I got a phone call on Sunday about 3 o'clock saying, the computer's making a lot of noise and smelling. Should I turn it off? It was one of the students coming in doing some work. And, of course, yes, please. It took us ages to, to, to knock this out. You know how much you can store on this disk? 5 million characters. Five meg. There's 130 million on that thing, upwards of, and this is an old five meg. When this thing came in, we thought it was revolution. Five million characters on one disk, incredible. But that's, I mean, that's technology now. It doesn't even make a good Frisbee because you kill the person at the other end. <laughs> right. okay. 
Let's look at storage devices then. So that's hard disks. Hard disks tend to be fixed into computers, but you can get removable versions that look like this thing, except put into a little packet that you have to have the little uh, storage area to stick it into in a computer. And that's about $1,000, and it's a very expensive way of doing it. But undoubtedly, we will eventually get removable hard disks. There's nothing like walking around. In fact, they now make them about that size. You can fit them into your back pocket, and they store up to 120 million characters. And you just throw it into the disk. Because instead of throwing in a floppy disk, you throw it on a hard disk. So that might come. We talked about the recording method. Very fast, very high capacity. You now get microcomputers quite standard with upwards of 300 million characters of storage. Optical disks are using the technology that you're all familiar with, that you currently use for CDs, right? And we call this CD-ROM, CD read-only memory. There's a computer CD, looks no different to the CD that you use, and indeed uses exactly the same technology. When the CD technology came out for sound, computing was very quick to pick up on it for a couple of reasons. One is capacity, and the other one is the technology that's used, which is very much, in fact, all a CD player is, is just a special purpose computer. The way it works is on CDs, holes are actually burned into a disk, so you have a hole, a hole, no hole, no hole, a hole, no hole, and a hole. And a CD might say, hey, that string of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven holes and no holes, in this case, I will interpret as Barnsey going, mm. Right? And there's another one, hole, 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 no hole and hole. Barnsley going, eh, right? And you put masses of these together, and you get Barnsley in full flight, complete with all the guitars and everything behind him, the drums, for eight songs or 10 songs or for an hour. Can you imagine how many holes you have on a disc to be able to do that? Literally billions, thousands of millions. Now, if you're talking about a hole or no hole, you're talking about binary. We'll be talking about binary in a few minutes, but computers work in binary. This technology is a prime candidate for computer use. It's already binary based, right? And it has the capacity to store millions upon millions. So your CD might say that's an uh, but the computer will say, hey, that's an A, that's a Z, this is an X, right? This is a hash mark, there's a nine, and so forth. So you can actually store data this way. As long as you string a whole bunch of these things together, say, oh, I'll treat a, a, a 1100101 as an A, right? And that's what it does. So on CD-ROMs, that CD-ROM that I have here holds 500 million characters of data. And indeed, they're now producing them upwards of 1 billion, 1,000 million characters of data. This is half the occupational health and safety database for uh, Canada. Okay, we get it coming in, uh, what, once a quarter, we pay $25, we get two new disks and updated. On here, you could hold upwards of 300 textbooks. Now, if you think about it, what's stopping you now having your whole library on a textbook? What do we need a library for anymore? What do you pay for your amenity fee? Here, $250, $300? OK, we'll add 25 bucks to it, and we'll give you a couple of CDs. It's got all the accounting and business text you're ever going to need. Right? All you need is a CD-ROM player. Do you all have a CD-ROM player? No, there's one problem. Right? Uh, you have to be attached to a computer to actually read it. Oh, shit, I don't want to be sitting at my desk all the time. What happens if I go to school? Well, the Japanese have already got over that problem, because there's a portable CD-ROM player. Now, you've got to read it on the screen, and things will change. And when you're going home, would you rather be reading a book like this on the bus, right? Or would you be rather reading a bloody great big thing like this? That's up to you, right? But times will change. But we will eventually be reading this. But the worst thing is, what do you think the copyright laws would say with 25 bucks? Here's 300 textbooks for you, right? Copyright would obviously prevent it. So it's just like photocopying, not on, right? But times will change. But the things that computing uses this for is the problem is that once you've burnt a hole into a disk, you can't change it. So the data is fixed. Whereas with, obviously, the other disk technologies, it's like a tape recorder or video recorder. It's just a magnetic spot. You can change it. You can re-record over it. So you can change your data. So this is used for fixed data. I mean, the Bureau of Statistics, once they've done a statistical survey, they put, that doesn't change, right? There were 17 blonde people in 27 West Street in Sydney when we did the statistic. They were there. That's it. It goes onto the disk. You can put in company price lists that only change once a quarter and so forth. Occupational health and data, safety data, which is only updated once a quarter and so forth. So it tends to be for fixed data, not for movable data like uh, data about how many production items we made or what cars we got to make this week or what we paid Fred or what we're going to pay Fred and so forth. By the way, just to give you an idea of this technology, those holes tend to have a skew to them because when it's burnt by the laser, the disk is spinning at high speed. That hole is 43 molecules long by 15 molecules wide. Now you can understand why you can get thousands and millions of holes on just one of these little disks. 
But really, the engineer is astounding. Absolutely astounding. You also have the capability of storing data using tape. And in the old days, they actually used to use reel-to-reel -reel tape. Remember that, guys, some of you, ladies, anybody who's middle-aged? You used to have tape recorders that worked with tape that looked like this. There's a computer tape, right? And again, read-write. That's, you can write on it. That's write protected. But um, the problem with tape is that you can't go directly to the record you want. So if this is a tape with um, Albert Arfark on it or something, right through to Zelda Zorch, Arfark will be at the beginning and Zelda Zorch will be at the end. Now on a disc, you just go straight to disc platter number 10, top side, right on the inside and you'll find Zelda, or top side of disc platter one, you'll find Albert, and then you can access each one at the same speed. Here you have to wind all the way through to find Zelda. So tape isn't as, as successful or popular. Was very popular because it was cheap, hell of a lot cheaper than discs, but now we've got high capacity discs which are just as cheap as tape. So tape now basically is devolved down to something like that which is used to back up your discs. In other words, you've got a lot of data on your disc. What happens if your disc crashes or somebody steals your computer or whatever, something bad happens? Well, you've got to back it up. You can back it up onto another disc or you can do it cheaply and back it up onto tape. So 20, 40, 60 million characters on this tape. Zappo, five minutes, done automatically. I just put a little tape drive in my machine where you normally have a disc and you download your hard disc onto tape. Okay, so that's what tape is typically used for now as a backup medium for disc. RAM is talking about microchips, like those microchips you just saw inside that thing I'm handing around. And indeed, I've got 2K of RAM inside here, right? I've got a microchip in here which is capable of holding 2,000 characters. And that holds my diary. As I've said before, I get 50 diary items on here. A beep goes off at 3 o'clock tells me to pick up the letters. You also find RAM chips, for instance, for, used for storage in um, these electronic diaries that people carry around. And indeed, some of the computers that are now coming out that are so thin they haven't fit in tape drives or disk drives or anything, they've got RAM in built into them, 256,000 characters of storage and so forth. And they'll achieve a higher and higher profile. Very expensive method of storage, but incredibly fast, requires virtually no power, and of course, very, very small okay, as, as, as a storage technology. That's storage. Let's have a bit of fun now talking about processors. And I'm going to play around with your brain. Computers do two things. They store characters, okay, and they process them. And in processing them, either moving characters around, like I'm moving the name from the file to the storage area, whatever. But in processing numbers, they actually do arithmetic. So we're going to talk about the binary numbering system to understand how computers do arithmetic. Immediately saying, Mac, you promised me it had nothing to do with maths, and I agree it doesn't. I'm a three-year failure in maths in high school. It took arts to get away from maths, and damn me, I still had to do all the arts people had to do maths. Failed it again, thank God for summer exams. But here we go, binary numbering system, nothing complex. We work as human beings in a decimal numbering system. Why? What's the decimal numbering system? What's the base for the decimal numbering system? Ten. Where did ten come from? Yeah, that's how we were born. Ten fingers, right? So that's why we have a decimal numbering system. It's not the only numbering system that exists. If we'd been born like that, we'd be working something called the octal numbering system. Computers are born like that, so they work in the binary numbering system. There's a numbering system on any base you want to work with. But the two that we're going to be interested in is the one that we know and the one that computers know. Now, I'm about to prove to you something that you've never realized you've needed proved to you before, but here we go. How do you know that the number 365, get you too high on the board, that the number 365 actually is 365? They told you in kindergarten, said, yeah, man, I know it's 365. That's because my mom told me. They told you, yeah, I know it's 365. That's because my, yep, great, fine. I'll believe you. But has anybody ever proved it to you? Here we go. Numbering systems work to a base. And if we're dealing with decimal, which is what we're talking about here, the base is 10. In any numbering system, the first position is reserved for the number, the base number, to the power of zero. Oh, God, he's talking about powers, right? The power of one, the power of two, 10 to the power of three, if we happen to have another number here. What does that mean? Well, what's 10 squared? 10 times 10? It's 100, right? 10 cubed, 10 times 10 times 10? 1,000, 10,000, so forth, right? What's 10 to the power of one? 10. Here we go, what's 10 to the power of zero? 
How do you guys know that? Last year they didn't, this year they did. Did they all of a sudden start teaching the high school system or do you do it in accountancy? I never knew it was one, but any number to the power of zero is one. Years ago, I actually saw a proof out of the newspaper, and I almost swallowed my spoon at the dinner table, and I saw, shit, there it is. And I ripped it out, put it on the table, I thought, hey, I've got it nailed, right? I can now tell it very simple, and it disappeared. I don't know, dog chewed it, wife took it away, whatever, it disappeared, and I've never seen it. But believe you me, take this one on faith, unfortunately. Anything with the base of zero is one. You know, 10 to the power of one, 10 to the power of two is over. So here's your little bit of faith. Now, what are we saying when we say 365? We're saying that we've got five ones, We've got six tens. Now oh, you can see this coming, can't you? We've got three one hundreds. So what are we saying? What's five ones? Five. What's six tens? Sixty. What's three one hundreds? Three hundred. What's three hundred plus sixty plus five? Three hundred and sixty-five. I have just proved to you that three hundred and sixty-five really is three hundred and sixty-five. Right? Any arguments? A little bit like a shell game, eh? Where's the P? You could swear it was under that one, but it's not, right? 365 really is 365, but what I've shown you here is how a numbering system works. Let's talk about binary. Now, in any one position here, how many characters can you have in decimal? 10, 0 through 9, right? 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, what? That fills up all our fingers. In a binary numbering system, how many can you have? 2. And you know what they go and choose when they do binary? Here's a binary number for you. You say, Mac, that's 1011. I'm saying, oh, no, it isn't. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, right? Now, what we should have done was really have chosen a character that looked like that, maybe a character that looked like that. But no, they say, hey, let's choose two characters that we all know. We'll choose a one and a zero. But we say, hey, but those are decimal characters. And I say, oh, no, no, no. In this case, they're binary characters. So think of that as an ooh and an ah and an ooh and an ooh, OK? Don't think of them as one, zero, one, one. Let's then look at one, zero, one, one in binary and convert it and find out what it is in decimal. One, zero, one, one. We have to have a base. What's our base? Two. Exam question <laughs> worth about one and a quarter percent of your final exam mark. Converting a binary to a decimal, right? So here we go. Two, two. They're all to the base of two. And numbering system, the first one is to the base of zero. I think this is in your textbook, by the way. First one is the base of one, base of two, base of three. What's two times two? Four. Two to the power of one. Any number to the power of zero? Two times two times two? Eight. 16 bit computers, 32 bit computers, Commodore 64, Commodore 128, 256K, 512K, 10,024 equals one kilobyte, right? Start to make sense. See progressions? Ever heard of that in computing before? All because we're working with a base of two in computing. So what are we saying? Well, we just do what we, and in fact, we've already done the conversion because we said, hey, this is a decimal one, a decimal two, a decimal four, and a decimal eight. We've already done the decimal conversion. What do we do? We've got one of the ones. We've got one of the twos. We've got zero of the fours. And we've got one of the eights. So what have we got? We've got one, two, no fours, and an eight. What's eight plus two plus one? Eleven. That is actually eleven. It's a mm, uh, mm, or whatever but it's an 11 in decimal. Okay. So when you type in 11, the computer actually stores that. Well, near enough. Okay. And then when we say, hey, what have you got in that register? It says, oh, shit, I've got some joker there who needs it in a decimal numbering system, so it does a quick conversion back the other way, and says, oh, that's an 11, right? And puts it up on the screen. So you can store things in binary. At least you can store numbers. We'll talk about letters in a minute. What about doing arithmetic in binary? <coughs> Now, don't worry about this one because I'm not going to ask you an arithmetic question in the test, right? Well, let's try arithmetic, shall we? Let's take a number we already know, and we know that's 11. Let's take another number, which is uh, 0101. Let's take an easy one like that. What is that number in decimal? Well, you can easily figure it out. What have we got? We've got an 8. We've got no 4s. We've got a 2, and we've got no 1s. What's 8 plus 2? 10. What's 10 plus 11? 21. So we better get an answer that equals 21. Okay, here we go. Let's add it up. Put a little add sign. Remember this from grade two? All right. What's one plus zero? One. What's one plus one? Yeah, somebody said two. It's not two. Don't forget there are only two characters, an un and an a, or a one and a zero in here, right? So what happens if you add two to nine? You get 11. You have to carry something, right? 
So 1 plus 1 is 0, carry 1. 1? 1 plus 1 is 0, carry 1. Now, what do we got here? We've got a 16. We haven't quite progressed out. We've got a 16, no 8s. We've got a 4, no 2s, and we've got a 1. What's 16 plus 4 plus 1? 21. Can you do arithmetic in binary? Can you multiply in binary? Can you subtract in binary? Can you divide in binary? Can you do the power of binary? If you can add, you can do anything, right? Okay, I don't know how the hell you do the other ones, but I know since you can do this, you must be able to do the other ones. So a computer can do an arithmetic in binary. Now, a computer not only works with numbers, it also works with letters. Now here's the problem. When I said we type 11 and actually stores this into a computer, it doesn't. Let's step back a little bit. How many characters is a computer going to have to store? It's talking to us in English, right? So it has to be able to store 26 uppercase, 26 lowercase, right? So we can have an uppercase A and a lowercase A. We've got those 10 funny number things that decimal people require. An exclamation marks, equals signs, pound signs, dollar signs. We probably need about 30 of those. And the computer probably needs about another 10 special characters that it can send down to the printer saying, hey, wake up, I'm about to send some data, or to modem to say I'm about to talk to you, or didn't understand you, or please retransmit or something. So at any stage, it has to be able to store 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, what's that, 102? 102? 102 characters. 102 characters will give it the full penelope of language that it requires to be able to talk to us, and indeed talk to its bits and pieces. So what happens is that we have storage locations inside computers that work in binary. Now, why, why are we talking about binary? Why do computers work in binary? What's the main lifeblood that goes through a computer? It's dead until you turn on the electricity. Now, electricity can have several states. We could say, hey, you see this little cross here? It could have an electrical charge which has got this, or it's got that amperage, or we haven't even got these lights on, have we? Okay, but the dimmer lights. In other words, you could have an amperage of 0.3 millivolts or 0.2 millivolts or something crazy like that. Or the easiest thing is to say, hey, you know, either the damn thing's there or it isn't, right? Either it's on or it's off. And that's the easiest thing. Either we've got a charge at this vacuum tube, at this transistor, or at this little cross here, and we've got this fantastic microchip. On or off. That's why it works in binary. So, at any one position in a storage location inside a chip, you can have either an electrical charge or no electrical charge, or a zero or a one or a positive or a negative or whatever. But if you've got one little position, and they call it a, a bit for a binary digit, how many different states can it have? On, off, or zero or one. It can only have two, right? So why don't we string two of these little bits together? Now how many different states can you have? One, one, zero, one, one, zero, or one, one. That's four different states. So I'll tell you what. A 1-1 one, one will say is an A, a 1-0 will say is a B, a 0-1 will say is a C, and a 0-0 will say is a D. But that's only got us the first four of our 26 here. We need 102. So that's still not enough, right? So it's 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, 128. So if we put 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 of these together, how many different states can you have? Up to 128 different states. It can be all 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, or it can be 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 0, or 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, and so forth. 128 of them, right? Which means that we can store the 102 characters we want. So early computers started out what they call registers with not seven of these, but actually eight. The eighth one was what's called a check bit. And I won't bother you about it, but it's a little bit like that letter that comes at the end of your student number. It doesn't actually form part of your student number. It's just there so that when people type it in, the computer does a calculation and says, I should have a Z. They typed in a Z, therefore they must have typed in it correctly. Oh, they just typed in a Y. It's incorrect. I better ask for it again. So they have a check bit inside. Because the, these things tear around inside the computer at the speed of light all over the place. So they've got to make sure it's transmitted from the CPU to the disk, the disk to the CPU, from one part of the CPU to another correctly. So they have a check bit. So you actually have an 8-bit register, which has become known in computing as a byte. Ever heard of a byte? God alone knows why they call it a byte, but they do. It's now the name of a famous computing magazine in the United States. It comes out 250 pages every month, everything you want to know about what's happening in computing. So what they've done is they've come up with a standard saying, fine, we have to store data in binary. And if you are working to an ASCII standard, which all computers do, if my computer sends a 01000001 down to your computer, your computer will recognize that as an A. The same code, I don't know where the hell, in fact, they don't have the same code, but if you're working with an IBM mainframe computer, they have their own computer standard called EBCDIC. 
in which case an A is a 11000001, right? So they have standards. We can bless the Yanks, the American Standard Code for Information Interchange, that's not, that's not ASC2, that's ASCII, American Standard Code for Information Interchange, for fixing what the standard's going to be. And that's around about 1950s, and that's what we use now. So we store data inside computers in at least registers of eight characters. As it turns out now, I won't explain why, but we're using registers that are even big, bigger. 32-bit computers, 16-bit computers, and so forth. So not only can you store data, characters and numbers, but you can actually do calculations in binary. So there's a whole universe in binary inside your computer. And you're saying, Mac, that's great. But really, you know, it's been interesting, but I'm going to go home and forget about this because it's got nothing to do with me. Anybody here got a father or brother or mother who's a brain surgeon? Sister? Hopefully not. Anybody who's into neurophysics or whatever, or whatever the bloody thing is? OK, here we go. Over the top again, right? When they go to examine your brain, I don't know if I've done this with you before. If you've got something wrong with you and they want to examine what's inside your brain, you go into the hospital, they put this machine around you. What's it called? No, a CAT scanner actually looks at bones and things like this. They want to figure out what's happening inside your brain. No, an electroencephalograph. Cephal, cephal, that's, isn't that Latin or something to do with your brain? What's the electro part? Electricity. What are they reading inside your head? What's going on inside your head? Nothing. Yeah, I know for a lot of you, <laughs> that just means that the electrical factory is dead. You know what's going on inside your head? Electricity. There's all sorts of electricity going around inside your head. Now, when I say bullshit to you, do you all of a sudden say, oh shit, B-U-L-L-S-H-I-T, exclamation mark, store that somewhere as a visual thing on your brain. And I come back and ask you five minutes later, what did I say? Mac was something naughty, I can't tell you, but it's there in great big lights. <laughs> How is it stored? Well, if you've got electrical pulses inside your head, was it stored in binary? I don't know. Your brain might be full of ones and zeros. Who knows? And I had an acquaintance of a friend of mine who would never stand still because he was concerned that the electrical wires were always talking to him. And we always thought he was nuts. But I'm beginning to realize his brain was probably just a little bit more active than yours and mine. And Etza was actually controlling his brain. He didn't trust. He felt more comfortable in a city where he wasn't close to electricity. Anyway, so way over the top. Now, I've got five minutes, and this is going to cause some disconcerting concern for some of you because you'll find it probably a little bit too cerebral. But I want to really go over the top now and try and convince you that not only is a computer a computer, and is your brain a computer, but the whole bloody universe is a computer, right? Just to put us into some sort of frame of mind for understanding what this technology is about. So it's going to take me five minutes to read this. If you find it a bit too much, please don't rustle papers. Just fall asleep quietly, because there will be some people who are listening. For some time now, Edward Fredkin has been insisting that the universe is a computer. I don't mean we should try and discover it's an IBM 4381, he hastens to add. What I, what I mean is that it may work according to the same principles as a computer. With or without qualification, though, Fredkin's ideas don't mesh with those of mainstream physicists, who generally consider mass and energy as the main ingredients of reality. I believe the basic stuff that everything is made of is not mass and energy, but information. Fredkin is a professor at Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and he works in a traditionally obscure but increasingly visible part of academia, the interface of physics and computer science. This is a twilight zone of modern science, a place where seemingly clear-cut problems of engineering lead to hazy, quasi-philosophical issues, and people sometimes disappear over the horizon in search of solutions. In this realm, where novel ways of thinking are commonplace, Fredkin gets a more sympathetic hearing than in the conventional scientific circles. While few give his worldwide view an unqualified endorsement, endorsement many consider it worth contemplating. And here we go. Fredkin shares an interest in cellular automata, a class of computer programs developed by John von Neumann, the patron saint of computer science, around about 1950. In some respects, cellular automata resemble those splendid graphic displays produced at well-disciplined masses in authoritarian societies, or indeed by avid football fans on American campuses. I don't know if you remember some of the historical images of China and so forth, where you'd have a whole wall of people, and they're all holding cards, and on cue, they'd hold up a card, and all of a sudden, a picture would appear. And then they'd hold the card and turn it around with a different color or something like that and have a different picture. It's incredible. We can actually make pictures appear and disappear. And all they're doing is they've just got a binary system. One card side, the other card side. Black, white, red, green, whatever. So by holding up large colored cards on cue, they can collectively generate portraits of Lenin, Mao Zedong, or indeed the University of Southern California Trojan. You might see one of those if you go over, right? More impressive still, one portrait can fade out and another crystallize in the blink of an eye. Again and again, one frozen frame melts into another. It's a, a spectacular feat of precision and planning. 
but suppose there were no planning. Suppose that instead of memorizing an elaborate succession of cards to display, everyone learned a single, simple rule for determining which card was called for next, without a clue as to what sort of pattern the rule's repeated application would create. Assuming, for example, all cards were either black or white, each card holder might be instructed to survey his four nearest neighbors, front and back, left and right, you might call this a von Neumann neighborhood, and do what the majority did during the last frame with a tie going to white. So if it was black, black, black and white, well then I'll hold up black and the next, next time they have a beat of the clock. We might call this the 1990s rule. The result would not be a series of predetermined portraits, but a progression of rather more abstract patterns, each one a subtle and dramatic variation on the last. In stadiums and cellular automata alike, the pattern produced depends on the rule used and the original configuration of the cells. This leaves room for abundant variety. There are many ways to define the neighborhood. It could be seven people in this direction, 16 people around me, or whatever, whoever you're going to poll. That's, the, that's part of the rule. And for each neighborhood, there could be many possible rules, most of them a bit, though not much more complicated than blind conformity or rigid nonconformity. Do what the majority did, do what the majority didn't do, do what the next three odd people along did, and so forth. But two things never change. Each cell uses the same rule to determine future behavior by reference to the past neighborhood norms, and all cells obey the rules simultaneously. No sooner do they gauge current fashion and follower deny it than fashion changes. Now, they've actually done this on computers. They have designed programs. Essentially, OK, fine, you've got you know, 80 pixels across here and 40 pixels down there. Each one of them you can consider to be in an on or an off. And you set up the rules inside the computer, very simple programming language. And it's incredible, the patterns that grow on the screen. As they describe here, well, just, just describe it, you can actually get a snowflake growing. A snowflake is one of the most complex constructs that nature builds other than living animals. Okay, you look at a snowflake under a microscope and it's incredible. You can get that just through happenstance. If you run one of these programs for anywhere from half an hour to six days, it'll eventually come up with something that looks like a snowflake. It just occurs. So an electron now, in this case in Fredkin's universe, is nothing more than a pattern of information. So an electron is nothing physical in his universe, it's just information. And an orbiting electron is nothing more than that pattern moving. Indeed, even this motion is in some sense illusory. The bits that substitute the pattern that, sorry, that constitute the pattern never actually move any more than football fans change places, or like a wave. You have a wave going across the ocean. Nothing's moving in the ocean. A couple of molecules are moving up and down, but there's no actual movement of water as the wave moves. That's just the water going up and down. It makes it look like there's actual movement going. And that's what they're saying here. There's no movement of electrons at all. It's just a pattern of information. Each bit stays put and confines its activity to blinking on and off. The rule that tells each bit when to turn on or off is a basic law of physics, and the universal computer is in charge of enforcing it. This sounds suspiciously like deus ex machina. God is just a computer. What kind of laws are these if some invisible enforcer, some universal intelligence, has to be invented to account for their power? The problem with this criticism is that it applies equally to conventional physics. The laws of physics, usually expressed as differential equations, do an exemplary job of keeping things under control. But how? What gives the equations force? Why do electrons what do what's expected of them? What makes the planets obey the laws of gravity? Physicists don't know, so most of them just finesse the issue. Nobel laureate Richard Feynman, though, has at least acknowledged the mystery. The important thing about physical law, he once remarked, is not how clever we are to have found out about it, but how clever nature is to actually pay attention to it. The universe is permeated by a kind of intelligence, however you look at it, and it's scarcely more ludicrous to declare, as Friedkin does, that the universe is run by a computer than to suggest, as physicists implicitly do, that the universe is run by the Ministry of Differential Equations. In fact, Fredkin would contend his proposition is actually simpler of the two. A bright third grader could understand the rule governing a cellular automaton and, with a pencil and paper and enough time, could even predict the course of the automaton, chart the growth of the snowflake, follow the ripples in a pond, and even the ripples of a sound wave. But differential equations cannot be fathomed without a course or two in calculus. And presumably this comprehensibility gap, gap will grow as the two tools are applied to more basic physical levels. One especially disconcerting feature of reality is that as scientists penetrate it more and more deeply, they're forced to invoke more and more baffling mathematics to describe what they see. The problem, Fredkin believes, isn't with the reality, but the descriptive language. So as I move along, there's nothing physically moving along. It's just a bunch of little electrons bleeping on and off, right? I'm still back there. And if I go back, the electrons are still bleeping on and off to some sort of rule and law that's governing how it works. OK, the world's a computer. We'll get back to Earth next week. Twenty-one. Can you do arithmetic in binary? Can you multiply in binary? Can you subtract in binary? Can you divide in binary? Can you do the power of binary? If you can add, you can do anything, right? Okay, I don't know how the hell you do the other ones, but I know since you can do this, you must be able to do the other ones. So a computer can do an arithmetic in binary. Now, a computer not only works with numbers, it also works with letters. 
Now here's the problem. When I said we type 11 and actually stores this into a computer, it doesn't. Let's step back a little bit. How many characters is a computer going to have to store? It's talking to us in English, right? So it has to be able to store 26 uppercase, 26 lowercase, right? So we can have an uppercase A and a lowercase A. We've got those 10 funny number things that decimal people require. And exclamation marks, equals signs, pound signs, dollar signs. We probably need about 30 of those. And the computer probably needs about another 10 special characters that it can send down to the printer saying, hey, wake up, I'm about to send some data, or to modem to say I'm about to talk to you or didn't understand you or please retransmit or something. So at any stage, it has to be able to store 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, what's that, 102? 102? 102 characters. 102 characters will give it the full penelope of language that it requires to be able to talk to us and indeed talk to its bits and pieces. So what happens is that we have storage locations inside computers that work in binary. Now, why, why are we talking about binary? Why do computers work in binary? What's the main lifeblood that goes through a computer? It's dead until you turn on the electricity. Now, electricity can have several states. We could say, hey, you see this little crosshair? It could have an electrical charge which has got this, or it's got that amperage, or we haven't even got these lights on, have we? Okay, but the dimmer lights. In other words, you could have an amperage of 0.3 millivolts or 0.2 millivolts or something crazy like that. Or the easiest thing is to say, hey, you know, either the damn thing's there or it isn't, right? Either it's on or it's off. And that's the easiest thing. Either we got a charge at this vacuum tube, at this transistor, or at this little cross here, and we got this fantastic microchip. On or off. That's why it works in binary. So, at any one position in a storage location inside a chip, you can have either an electrical charge or no electrical charge, or a zero or a one or a positive or a negative or whatever. But if you've got one little position, and they call it a, a bit for a binary digit, how many different states can it have? On, off, or zero or one. It can only have two, right? So why don't we string two of these little bits together? Now how many different states can you have? One, one, zero, one, one, zero, or one, one. That's four different states. So I'll tell you what, a 1-1 one, one will say is an A, a 1-0 will say is a B, a 0-1 will say is a C, and a 0-0 will say is a D. But that's only got us the first four of our 26 here. We need 102. So that's still not enough, right? So it's 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, 128. So if we put 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 of these together, how many different states can you have? Up to 128 different states. It can be all 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, or it can be 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 0, or 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, and so forth. 128 of them, right? Which means that we can store the 102 characters we want. So early computers started out what they call registers with not seven of these, but actually eight. The eighth one was what's called a check bit. And I won't bother you about it, but it's a little bit like that letter that comes at the end of your student number. It doesn't actually form part of your student number. It's just there so that when people type it in, the computer does a calculation says, I should have a Z. They typed in a Z. Therefore, they must have typed it in correctly. Oh, they just typed in a Y. It's incorrect. I better ask for it again. So they have a check bit inside. Because the, these things tear around inside the computer at the speed of light all over the place. So they've got to make sure it's transmitted from the CPU to the disk, the disk to the CPU, from one part of the CPU to another correctly. So they have a check bit. So you actually have an 8-bit register, which has become known in computing as a byte. Ever heard of a byte? God alone knows why they call it a byte, but they do. It's now the name of a famous computing magazine in the United States. It comes out 250 pages every month, everything you want to know about what's happening in computing. So what they've done is they've come up with a standard saying, fine, we have to store data in binary. And if you are working to an ASCII standard, which all computers do, if my computer sends a 01000001 down to your computer, your computer will recognize that as an A. The same code, I don't know where the hell, in fact, they don't have the same code, but if you're working with an IBM mainframe computer, they have their own computer standard called EBCDIC, in which case an A is a 11000001, right? So they have standards. We can bless the Yanks, the American Standard Code for Information Interchange, that's not, that's not ASC2, that's ASCII, American Standard Code for Information Interchange, for fixing what the standard's going to be. And that's around about 1950s, and that's what we use now. So we store data inside computers in at least registers of eight characters. As it turns out now, I won't explain why, but we're using registers that are even big, bigger. 32-bit computers, 16-bit computers, and so forth. So not only can you store data, characters and numbers, 
but you can actually do calculations in binary. So there's a whole universe in binary inside your computer. And you're saying, Mac, that's great, but really, you know, it's been interesting, but I'm going to go home and forget about this because it's got nothing to do with me. Anybody here got a father or brother or mother who's a brain surgeon? Sister? Hopefully not. Anybody who's into neuro physics or whatever, or whatever the bloody thing is. Okay, here we go. Over the top again, right? When they go to examine your brain, I don't know if I've done this with you before, if you've got something wrong with you and they want to examine what's inside your brain, you go into the hospital, they put this machine around you, what's it called? No, a CAT scanner actually looks at bones and things like this. They want to figure out what's happening inside your brain. No, an electroencephalograph. Cephal, cephal, that's, isn't that Latin or something to do with your brain? What's the electro part? Electricity. What are they reading inside your head? What's going on inside your head? Nothing. Nothing. Yeah, I know for a lot of you, <laughs> that just means that the electrical factory is dead. You know what's going on inside your head? Electricity. There's all sorts of electricity going around inside your head. Now, when I say bullshit to you, do you all of a sudden say, oh shit, B-U-L-L-S-H-I-T, exclamation mark, store that somewhere as a visual thing in your brain. And I come back and ask you five minutes later, what did I say? Mac was something naughty, I can't tell you, but it's there in great big lights. <laughs> How is it stored? Well, if you've got electrical pulses inside your head, was it stored in binary? I don't know. Your brain might be full of ones and zeros. Who knows? And I had an acquaintance of a friend of mine who would never stand still because he was concerned that the electrical wires were always talking to him. And we always thought he was nuts. But I'm beginning to realize his brain was probably just a little bit more active than yours and mine. And Etza was actually controlling his brain. He didn't trust. He felt more comfortable in a city where he wasn't close to electricity. Anyway, so way over the top. Now. I've got five minutes, and this is going to cause some disconcerting concern for some of you because you'll find it probably a little bit too cerebral, but I want to really go over the top now and try and convince you that not only is a computer a computer and is your brain a computer, but the whole bloody universe is a computer, right? Just to put us into some sort of frame of mind for understanding what this technology is about. So it's going to take me five minutes to read this. If you find it a bit too much, please don't rustle papers, just fall asleep quietly because there will be some people who are listening. For some time now, Edward Fredkin has been insisting that the universe is a computer. I don't mean we should try and discover it's an IBM 4381, he hastens to add. What I, what I mean is that it may work according to the same principles as a computer. With or without qualification, though, Fredkin's ideas don't mesh with those of mainstream physicists, who generally consider mass and energy as the main ingredients of reality. I believe the basic stuff that everything is made of is not mass and energy, but information. Fredkin is a professor at Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and he works in a traditionally obscure but increasingly visible part of academia, the interface of physics and computer science. This is a twilight zone of modern science, a place where seemingly clear-cut problems of engineering lead to hazy, quasi-philosophical issues, and people sometimes disappear over the horizon in search of solutions. In this realm, where novel ways of thinking are commonplace, Fredkin gets a more sympathetic hearing than in the conventional scientific circles. While few give his worldwide view an unqualified endorsement, endorsement many consider it worth contemplating. And here we go. Fredkin shares an interest in cellular automata, a class of computer programs developed by John von Neumann, the patron saint of computer science, around about 1950. In some respects, cellular automata resemble those splendid graphic displays produced at well-disciplined masses in authoritarian societies, or indeed by avid football fans on American campuses. I don't know if you remember some of the historical images of China and so forth where you'd have a whole wall of people and they're all holding cards and on cue they'd hold up a card and all of a sudden a picture would appear and then they'd hold the card and turn it around with a different color or something like that and have a different picture. It's incredible. We can actually make pictures appear and disappear. And all they're doing is they've just got a binary system. One card side, the other card side. Black, white, red, green, whatever. So by holding up large colored cards on cue, they can collectively generate portraits of Lenin, Mao Zedong, or indeed the University of Southern California Trojan. You might see one of those if you go over, right? More impressive still, one portrait can fade out and another crystallize in the blink of an eye. Again and again, one frozen frame melts into another. It's a, a spectacular feat of precision and planning. But suppose there were no planning. Suppose that instead of memorizing an elaborate succession of cards to display, everyone learned a single, simple rule for determining which card was called for next, without a clue as to what sort of pattern the rule's repeated application would create. Assuming, for example, all cards were either black or white, each card holder might be instructed to survey his four nearest neighbors, front and back, left and right, you might call this a von Neumann neighborhood, and do what the majority did during the last frame with a tie going to white. So if it was black, 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 and white, well then I'll hold up black and the next, next time they have a beat of the clock. We might call this the 1990s rule. The result would not be a series of predetermined portraits, but a progression of rather more abstract patterns, each one a subtle and dramatic variation on the last. In stadiums and cellular automata alike, the pattern produced depends on the rule. 
used and the original configuration of the cells. This leaves room for abundant variety. There are many ways to define the neighborhood. It could be seven people in this direction, 16 people around me, or whatever, whoever you're going to poll. That's, the, that's part of the rule. And for each neighborhood, there could be many possible rules, most of them a bit, though not much more complicated than blind conformity or rigid nonconformity. Do what the majority did, do what the majority didn't do, do what the next three odd people along did, and so forth. But two things never change. Each cell uses the same rule to determine future behavior by reference to the past neighborhood norms, and all cells obey the rules simultaneously. No sooner do they gauge current fashion and follower deny it than fashion changes. Now, they've actually done this on computers. They have designed programs. Essentially, OK, fine, you've got you know, 80 pixels across here and 40 pixels down there. Each one of them you can consider to be in an on or an off. And you set up the rules inside the computer, a very simple programming language. And it's incredible the patterns that grow on the screen. As I describe here, I'll just, just describe it. You can actually get a snowflake growing. A snowflake is one of the most complex constructs that nature builds other than living animals. Okay? You look at a snowflake under a microscope, and it's incredible. You can get that just through happenstance. If you run one of these programs for anywhere from half an hour to six days, it'll eventually come up with something that looks like a snowflake. It just occurs. So an electron now, in this case, in Fredkin's universe, is nothing more than a pattern of information. So an electron is nothing physical in his universe. It's just information. And an orbiting electron is nothing more than that pattern moving. Indeed, even this motion is in some sense illusory. The bits that substitute the pattern uh, sorry, that constitute the pattern never actually move any more than football fans change places, or like a wave. You have a wave going across the ocean. Nothing's moving in the ocean. A couple of molecules are moving up and down, but there's no actual movement of water as the wave moves. That's just the water going up and down. It makes it look like there's actual movement going. And that's what they're saying here. There's no movement of electrons at all. It's just a pattern of information. Each bit stays put and confines its activity to blinking on and off. The rule that tells each bit when to turn on or off is a basic law of physics, and the universal computer is in charge of enforcing it. This sounds suspiciously like deus ex machina. God is just a computer. What kind of laws are these if some invisible enforcer, or some universal intelligence has to be invented to account for their power? The problem with this criticism is that it applies equally to conventional physics. The laws of physics, usually expressed as differential equations, do an exemplary job of keeping things under control. But how? What gives the equations force? Why do electrons what do what's expected of them? What makes the planets obey the laws of gravity? Physicists don't know, so most of them just finesse the issue. Nobel laureate Richard Feynman, though, has at least acknowledged the mystery. The important thing about physical law, he once remarked, is not how clever we are to have found out about it, but how clever nature is to actually pay attention to it. The universe is permeated by a kind of intelligence, however you look at it. And it's scarcely more ludicrous to declare, as Friedkin does, that the universe is run by a computer than to suggest, as physicists implicitly do, that the universe is run by the Ministry of Differential Equations. In fact, Fredkin would contend his proposition is actually simpler of the two. A bright third grader could understand the rule governing a cellular automaton and, with a pencil and paper and enough time, could even predict the course of the automaton, chart the growth of the snowflake, follow the ripples in a pond, and even the ripples of a sound wave. But differential equations cannot be fathomed without a course or two in calculus. And presumably, this comprehensibility gap, gap will grow as the two tools are applied to more basic physical levels. One especially disconcerting feature of reality is that as scientists penetrate it more and more deeply, they're forced to invoke more and more baffling mathematics to describe what they see. The problem, Fredkin believes, isn't with the reality, but the descriptive language. So as I move along, there's nothing physically moving along. It's just a bunch of little electrons bleeping on and off, right? I'm still back there. And if I go back, the electrons are still bleeping on and off to some sort of rule and law that's governing how it works. OK, the world's a computer. We'll get back to Earth next week.